One of the things that we get asked a lot is how to do controller input. And we've been holding off on doing a video on this while we were waiting for Unity's new input system. But the input system is now here, and it actually makes it really easy to set up everything from gamepad buttons to thumbsticks. But before we get into it, this video is sponsored by Jason Wyman. Now, of course, we've been making videos for a while, but sometimes it can be hard to stay motivated when just watching videos by yourself. I mean, I should know. I'm on my ninth year of self-taught game development. So to solve this problem, Jason is offering courses where you work alongside other students and always have access to one-on-one -on -one help from Jason himself. I think this is a really cool way to learn, and Jason has courses that cover everything from the very fundamentals of game dev to highly professional workflows. Take for example the Unity Mastery course. Here you will learn the whole process of creating a game from scratch and really get into topics like audio, animation, level creation, adding abilities to your characters, and pretty much everything that is to creating a finished game. On top of that, Jason has a lot of experience in the industry and it's just really easy and fun to learn from. Right now, we offer the first 50 people who sign up a free t-shirt from Line of Code, as well as a big discount and other bonuses on the courses. Simply click the link in the description to get started. Also, special thanks to Infinity PPR for his support on Patreon. And with that, pick up your controller and let's get cracking. So the first thing that we want to do is go to Window and open up the Package Manager. Manager. Here we'll make sure to select all packages and under advanced we want to show preview packages. We can then search for input and you should see the input system here. I'm going to be using version 0.2.10 so make sure you're using this version or later. Simply click it and install it using this button right here. When it's done it's going to ask you if you want to switch over to the new input system. Simply click yes and make sure to restart Unity afterwards to apply the changes. Otherwise your input won't register in the new system. So. Make sure to restart. Next up, you need to connect your gamepad. Now, this process is going to differ depending on the controller you're using. Some controllers will be plug and play, simply connect them to your computer and your OS will install the needed drivers automatically. However, in some cases, most often if you're using wireless controllers or older controllers like PlayStation 3 controllers, you need to find the drivers yourself. I would recommend looking up your type of controller as well as your operating system and there will be plenty of guides available on how to set up your particular gamepad. I have a PlayStation 4 controller here. For me, it's as simple as connecting it through USB to my Windows 10 stationary computer. Remember, you can always go to Settings, then Devices, to see if your device is connected. Mine is showing up right here. Once it is, you will also see that Unity prints a log saying that you connected a joystick. Finally, you can go to Window, Analysis, and open up the Input Debugger. If everything is set up correctly, you will see all the input devices connected to your computer here. And indeed, the PS4 controller is showing up. Yay! So now that we have properly connected our gamepad, we're ready to start creating our input. And with the new input system, all of this is done using an input actions asset. So let's go to the project, hit create, and let's select input actions at the very bottom here. Let's call it player controls. And let's double click it to open it up in a new window. I'm just gonna go ahead and dock this in the center. And as you can see, it's currently completely empty. So the first thing that we need to do is add an action map. Now action maps are simply used to group together actions that are related to each other. In our case, we will have very few actions here, so we can simply go ahead and create a single one called gameplay, which is going to store all of our actions. And by default, when creating an action map, it's also going to create a single action. As you can see, it's called new action and it currently has no input connected to it. So let's go ahead and rename this action here to grow. And that's because I've gone ahead and set up a very, very simple example scene here. All it has is a camera, a light, some post-processing and this cube. And I thought we could use the inputs to control this cube. So let's start by having our cube grow every time we press a button. And that's why we're calling this action grow. We then need to add a binding to this action, which means that we are telling it what we need to press in order for the action to be triggered. So let's select the no binding here and to the right, we now have a menu for going into all of the different types of input and choosing a button. You can see for the gamepad here, we have all of the different available buttons. And you will notice that these buttons have very generic names. This is because they will automatically map to the controller you have connected. You can also choose to bind to specific controllers if you want. They are at the bottom here and you can see there's a PS4 controller, there's an Xbox controller and so on or you can simply select from this list here and everything will be set up for you. So in my case here, I want to use the button south, which is right here. However, what we can also do is hit this listen button right here. We then pick up our gamepad and press the key that we would like to trigger. 
And you can now see that it notices that we've pressed this button, the button south, and we can then choose it. I think that's just a really cool feature and it makes it so much faster to quickly set up your input. So now we've set up our grow button. Let's go ahead and add a couple more actions. So let's hit the plus sign here next to action. And this one is going to be for moving around our cube. So we'll just call it move. And I don't want to bind this to a button. Instead, I want to bind it to the left thumbstick. So to do that, we'll again select no binding here. And for the path, we can again go under the gamepad and we can of course find the thumbstick or we could just hit listen. I'm gonna move around the thumbstick a bit. And as you can see, it shows all the different variants of this input. We just want to choose the default left stick for the gamepad. And now we've bound the thumbstick. Really, really easy stuff. In fact, let's go ahead and do this again for the right stick. And let's have it control our rotation. So we'll create a rotate action. Let's again go to the path and listen. I'm gonna move around the right thumbstick. And here we get the right stick. Let's select it. And that's pretty much all we need to do for setting up our input. We can now save this input asset. It's important that you remember to do this or your changes won't be applied. And at this point, we're ready to create a script that will do things based on this input. And one thing that we can do to make the script writing process much easier is to select our player controls object and check off generate C sharp class. This is going to create a C sharp script based on the inputs you have specified here. This will make it easier for us to program for these inputs because we avoid having to access everything using strings. That might sound a bit confusing, so let's see this in action. Let's go ahead and hit apply. And you can see on the assets here in our project, it's now created a player controls C sharp script. Now you don't need to edit or worry about this at all. Just know that it's there. So now let's go ahead and create our cube script. Let's select our cube. Let's hit add component. Let's create a cube script and hit create and add. And let's double click this to open it up in Visual Studio. So the first thing that we want to do when working with the new input system is make sure that we're using the right namespace. So at the top here, we'll write using Unity Engine dot input system. We also want to create an instance of the input action asset that we created. So we called it player controls. So we'll write that here and let's just refer to it as our controls. Let's also remove our start and update method and let's instead write void awake. And remember the awake method is just like start except it's called even before start is. Then in here we can set controls equal to a new player controls object. So now we've basically just created a player controls object that we can refer to going forward as controls every time we want to do something with input within this script. And the first thing that we want to do is of course make our cube grow whenever the grow action is triggered. So let's make some room here and let's go controls dot and if we go into Unity now, we can see the structure that we need to go through here. So first we need to go into the right action map, which is gameplay, and we then need to access the grow action. So all we need to do through code is do dot, then the action map, which is gameplay, and then the action, which is grow. And this is the really neat thing about making sure that we are generating a C sharp class file. Because if we didn't do this, we would have to go in and for each one of these steps, we would have to search for an action map and an action. And we'd have to do this using strings, which is not at all as solid. So that's really cool. So now we found the right action, but how do we make something happen based on this? Well, first of all, we need to understand that each action in the input system has different faces that we can use to trigger input. Mainly, we need to focus on dot .started dot performed and dot cancelled. In this case, we want something to happen when the player performs the action of pressing the button. So we'll use dot performed. Now, this is a callback. What that means is that we can add a function to this that will be triggered when the action is performed. We do this by writing plus equals and then the name of the function that we want to trigger. So let's go ahead and create a function for this. So down here, we can simply add a function void and let's call it grow. And all we want to happen inside this function is we want to go transform dot local scale. So we'll take our current scale and let's multiply it. So star equals by 1.1. So this is going to increase our scale a tiny bit. And now all we need to do to trigger this function is simply write it up here. In other words, when this action gets performed, we want to make sure that it calls the grow function. However, you will notice that this is currently giving us a red line. And that's because when the performed callback gets triggered, it also sends out some information about the context of the event. 
This is great because later when we implement the thumbsticks, this will allow us to read a value that tells us what direction they are pointing. However, in this case here, we don't really need this information. So to tell Unity how we want to use this context information, if at all, we can use something called lambda expressions. Now that might sound really scary, but you can basically think of lambda expressions kind of like mini functions. So a lambda expression works by inserting a parameter on the left. In our case, this is the context of our action. We can call this anything we want, but I'm just gonna call it CTX for context. Then we write equal sign greater than, which reads as goes to, and then on the right, we can write an expression. And this is where we can do things using our context parameter. However, in this particular case, we just wanna ignore it. Instead, we will simply call the grow function. So now we're using a Lambda expression to tell Unity that we are aware that there is some context for this action, but we don't really wanna use it here. We just wanna call the function. Again, you will see why performing this step will be useful later when working with thumbsticks. Now we're almost ready to test this out. We just need to do one thing, and that is make sure that we're enabling and disabling these input actions whenever we need them. So we can just go ahead and do this inside of an void on enable. And as the name suggests, this function is going to be called whenever this object gets enabled. And here we can just go controls.gameplay.enable. So it's simply going to activate all of our actions in this action map. And let's do the same thing for disabling. So void on disable. And here we simply go controls.gameplay.disable. And that's all we need to do. If we now save this script, go into Unity, let's switch over to our game view and hit play. We should see that if I pick up the controller here and press the X button, indeed our cube will grow. Awesome. So next up, let's implement movement. And this really isn't that much harder. In fact, we're going to start out the exact same way here. So we'll do controls.gameplay. And then instead of using the grow action, we'll use dot move dot performed plus equals. We'll again name our context CTX goes to, and this is where our context gets really useful because we don't just want to know that our thumbstick was moved. We want to know in what direction and how far. And we can store this in a vector too, our movement on the X and our movement on the Y. So let's go ahead and create a vector two up here and let's call it move. Then down here, we can set move equal to our context dot read value. And we're going to read a value of type vector two. And let's then just close that off. So up here, when triggering something, we're calling the grow function. But down here, we don't need to call a function. We just need to set move equal to the value of our thumbstick. And that's all we need to do. We probably also want to reset this value when we're not moving the thumbstick. So let's go controls dot gameplay dot move dot canceled. So at this point, we stop moving the thumbstick. And again, plus equals context goes to move. And this time we can just set it equal to vector two dot zero. So just zero on the X and zero on the Y, we're not touching the thumbstick. And now we can use this value anywhere that we'd like. So if we want to move our object, let's do that inside of an update call. So let's go void update. And let's create a vector two with the amount that we want to move. So let's just call it M here. And we'll set it equal to a new vector two, which is going to take our movement.x and our movement.y. And let's multiply it with time.delta time to make it frame rate independent. We then call transform.translate in order to move our object by our M vector. And let's have this be relative to the world space. Also, because I've done this before, I know that with my scene, we need to reverse the movement on the X. So if we save this now and go into Unity, we should be able to control this cube here up and down and left and right by simply moving around our left thumbstick. So let's hit play. I'm gonna pick up the controller here and let's try. And indeed we can, it's working. And I can not only control the direction, I can also control the speed by only moving the thumbstick so much. Really, really cool. So finally, let's go ahead and implement the rotation. Again, we'll go controls.gameplay.rotate this time, dot performed, plus equals our context that goes to, and this time we simply want to create a variable for our rotation. So let's call it rotate. And again, we'll set rotate equal to our context.read value of type vector two. And the code is so similar that we can simply go ahead and copy from up here. 
So we want to reset it when we are canceling it. And we just want to change move to rotate and move to rotate over here as well. And now inside of our update, we can again create a vector two with the amount of rotation we want. So let's call it R. Let's create this based on a new vector two where we'll input a rotate dot Y. Again, we need to reverse this and our rotate dot X. And again, I'm using the Y here and the X here and I'm inverting some of them just because that's the orientation of my scene. If something is flipped for you, simply go ahead and remove a minus here or flip the two coordinates. We then multiply this by 100 to make it a bit quicker and also multiply again by time dot delta time to make it frame rate independent. Then we're going to write transform dot rotate. We're going to rotate based on our R vector. And again, we'll use world space. And that should be it. If we now save this, go into Unity and hit play, we can pick up our controller and we should now also be able to rotate. And indeed we can. Awesome. So now we can move around, we can rotate, we can do both at once. And we can of course grow the size of our cube by pressing this button. Yay! That's pretty much it for this video. If you liked it, make sure to subscribe and ring that notification bell so you don't miss the next one. Also, don't forget to check out Jason's courses and become a Unity wizard in no time. Simply click the link in the description to get started. On that, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Thanks to all of the awesome Patreon supporters who donated in May and a special thanks to Infinity PBR, Dennis Sullivan, Chris, Tyson Konowski, Shane Cleveland, Faisal Marify, Leo Lissette, Runin, Justin Palmer, Daniel Dusanik, Konstantinos Karensas, Noki Wasaki, Gregory Pierce, Erasmus, Timofoldebach, and Kirill Svideski. You guys rock.